How about those Danes? The EU's first nation to lift all domestic COVID restrictions, raising hopes in Northern Europe and beyond. Here in France, new infections have never been higher, but they're also relaxing the rules. That's because, well, the vaccination rate is near 90%. Hospitals are managing. The Omicron variant's more infectious, but milder. Milder if you have had the vaccine, warns the World Health Organization. Many nations remain vulnerable. Hard to believe, for instance, that the United States is one of those nations. What with such a huge stockpile of vaccines, impressive means to get the message out. And it's precisely the messaging that seems to be the problem. In the U.S. and in many countries, a clear and present public health risk has instead become an argument about free speech. The messaging, which as we've discovered with Neil Young pulling his music from streaming giant Spotify, is also about the medium. From the podcast that's at the center of this COVID misinformation row to competing cable news chatter, how do we get our news and how much does it matter and what to do to get out of this pandemic once and for all? Today in the France 24 debate, uh, we're talking about how to talk about COVID. And with us from London, Martin McKee, Professor of European Public Health at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. Thank you for joining us. Hi. From New York City, Stephen Rosenbaum, Executive Director of the New York City Media Lab. Tell us what the New York City Media Lab is. The New York City Media Lab is a consortium of universities, NYU, Columbia, the New School, CUNY, uh, based at NYU. And this is exactly our wheelhouse. We're thinking about media and technology and democracy and free speech. And these are complicated questions, but in this case, I think that I'm, I'm anxious to have this debate because I'd like to know who's going to be on the other side of it. All right. Well, we'll find out if uh, uh, Guillaume Gallet of Tech24 fame, uh, our, our, uh, our all things digital uh, editor, uh, will uh, be able to shed some clarity on this. Thanks for being with us. Hello, François. Thank you. The France 24 debate where you can join the conversation on Facebook and Twitter, hashtag F24 debate. Yeah, Denmark taking off the mask. But uh, first, let's talk about Tonga. It's going into lockdown. Two coronavirus cases, two uh, confirmed in that Pacific Island nation. Uh, it's had to lift its zero COVID travel policy to let in aid from last month's volcano eruption and tsunami. Tonga, where it's 61 percent of the population that's vaccinated. I begin Martin McKee with Tonga because it's just also a reminder to us we're you know, we're, we're sitting here in Europe, we're talking about the easing of lockdown rules, but we forget that in other parts of the globe, it's not the case. And if you've had a zero COVID travel policy, as was the case of that Pacific Island nation, uh, what's what lies ahead at this particular point in time? Well, I think with anything around COVID, we don't know what lies ahead. We've got to remember that the Pacific Islands can remember the experience of particularly measles brought in in ships in Samoa, a number of classic examples in the epidemiological literature, diseases that were brought in that were devastating. So that's almost certainly shaping the way in which they're looking at the world. But they've been very successful up until now. So the policies have worked well. And I think we often forget that the countries that have followed this uh, approach of trying to m absolutely minimize the uh, extent of COVID in their own countries. They're the ones that have succeeded, but they're picking up the pieces of the failures from other countries that haven't done that. So we tend to be critical, but we need to remember that they've gone through this, you know, look at a country like New Zealand. We're counting the number of deaths in the tens rather than in the hundreds of thousands. But it is absolutely true that whenever they do have to open their borders, there are challenges that are brought about by the failures elsewhere. You know, we're 48 hours away, Martin, from the uh, opening ceremonies at the Winter Games. And China's had this uh, zero COVID tra po travel policy. If you go there, you have to isolate under drastic conditions for a long while. Uh, is the other shoe going to drop? Because at some point they are going to have to reopen their borders. Yeah, they are going to have to reopen, but let's hope. The difficulty is we really don't know what's going to come next. And that's the challenge. So trying to look ahead, you know, we, there's this sort of hope, optimism around that maybe with Omicron, because it's milder, then this will be some way out of the pandemic. And it may well be. But we have absolutely no idea what the next variant will be, how much it will escape the existing immunity and how severe it will be. And that's are you saying that? Let me just ask you, Martin, are you saying that because you're a scientist and you want to be cautious? 
or are you saying it because you truly believe it? You really think that we don't know? I really think that we don't know. And if you look at it, we didn't. Who really anticipated the course of the pandemic so far? I mean, there were people at the beginning, deeply misguided people, who were saying, well, you let it run through, you'll get herd immunity, and then it'll be fine. Well, that's clearly not been the case. We had the Wuhan variant, then we had a more severe alpha, and in some parts of the world, beta and gamma, and then we had delta. And now we've got uh, that they've all been more severe than the ones they replaced. Now we've got one which is less severe than the one it replaced. But what will come next? And there's no uh, there's no natural law that means that viruses somehow or other always become less virulent. There are a few examples of where they have done, but there are many where they haven't. All right, uh, Stephen Rosenbaum, what Martin McKee is saying there that yeah, the, 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 it's becoming uh, less virulent as it's as as we get new variants of COVID. But that's not necessarily what will happen in the future. That's a message that, well, <laughs> plenty of people in our newsroom here don't want to hear after two years of, uh, of all we've been through. Uh, so the, the question again is, is, how do you get that message across to stay cautious? You, you know, this phrase, going viral, you have to remember that for the history of social media, that was considered a good thing. You know, let's go viral. The post is going viral. You know, th what we really are facing, and I think it's why this time is different than times before, is we're talking about a virus of misinformation that is being spread by social media, and there's no evidence that's slowing down at all. Do you agree with that, that there's a the, a, the, the virus of misinformation, Guillaume Gralet? Uh I think that uh, everyone has the same voice. So, of course, misinformation is just spreading. I, I totally agree. Yeah. All right, totally agree on that one. What well, we we what is what is you what cannot be contested are hard facts, and it was a bit of a surprise uh, for many uh, when they looked on the New York Times's website uh, this Wednesday and saw that the U.S., the world's number one superpower, leads the world in COVID fatalities. We we knew that. But it's also printed, and here you show, see the study that shows that per capita, the U.S. has had more deaths since the start of the pandemic than any wealthy country by far, as you can see, ahead of the likes of Belgium and Britain. What is worse, though, is the number of cumulative deaths since December the 1st. And that date matters because that's when the Omicron variant first started to spread. And there, the gap between number two on the Times' chart, Germany, France, not far behind, by the way, uh, is very, very far. And you've got to wonder, Martin McKee, are these unnecessary deaths? Well, clearly they're unnecessary deaths. I mean, if you simply look at the countries that are performing best in the world and subtract their death rate from the ones that, that are performing worst, those are the unnecessary deaths by definition. And this is simply and plainly down to not getting vaccinated. No, it's much more than that. And I think when we look at the United States, we have to remember there's a, a paper that's just come out today looking at some of the explanations. Trust in the authorities is really, really important. And obviously that feeds into vaccine uptake, but it feeds into doing all of the other things that can be done to reduce the spread of, the, of transmission of this virus. So, you know, when we look at what, what makes a difference, what are the things that work? Essentially, it's a virus which spreads in enclosed indoor spaces. So if you can minimise that level of exposure, you're going to get less transmission. And it's a virus that spreads particularly, and it does harm to people who don't have immunity. So you want to get the vaccination rate up. And when you have a combination of people who, for their distrust in authority, are neither getting vaccinated nor taking precautions, then it's almost inevitable that you're going to have problems. Guillaume Gallet, we spent uh, all summer uh, covering people who didn't have trust in the French authorities. Yeah. Uh, there were those uh, anti-vaxxer demonstrations, and they, you know, they, they owned our news cycle for a few weekends uh, during the summer. But then we saw in the fall that everybody went and got their jab. So uh, do we have an idea of how much people really distrust authority in this country? I think um, there is a problem of distrusting authorities, but also distrusting the media. And not everyone, not every platform can be behave like a media. When you have a media, you have got some responsibilities. And we're going to speak about Spotify later. Um, you cannot, as Neil Long is saying, take profit from uh, any... Uh, 
they choose they have to choose what they profit do you from. feel as though the french because we we had low numbers when it came to other vaccines before covid hit in france yeah. but comparative to other european nations yeah do you have do you feel the, why is it that the french who have this reputation of distrusting authority went out and still got their jabs yeah i yeah, maybe it's a little bit of a cliche, uh, and we just have to explain people. And for that, again, the media are, are very much important, but you don't have to disdain people. You just have to explain them in a very simple word. Maybe so, they, so they did a good job, their public information campaign. Yeah, and I mean, uh, you don't, yeah, I think it's, it's getting better. And, and also you don't have to, to tell them you're dumb uh, because you don't want to make this change. You have to explain more and more and to... That, that's the best way to, to have better uh, uh, confidence in science. Stephen Rosenbaum, we had a lot of public information campaigns about COVID in this country, and France has not run the same way that the United States is. Here it's very top-down. What did you think about the, 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 the public efforts to get the message out to social distance, uh, to test, to get uh, vaccines? How did it go in the U.S.? I went terribly. Uh, you know... The U.S., if you were to ask everyone who's in a hospital about to go on a ventilator, a couple of basic questions like, did you get the vaccine? No. What media do you consume? And the answer would have been, and again, I'm making this up because I don't believe these questions have been asked. The answer would have been Fox News or Gab or Telegram or one of these, mm. you know, kind of hard right misinformation replicators. You know, it's all of the media that has been trying to explain to people patiently and gently and thoroughly with data is reaching people that are reachable. And, you know, I, I believe that, you know, the, the problem we face is that the virus of misinformation isn't going away um, and it is inevitably going to come up again. And is you know, that these virus are people of who, misinformation, yeah. is it new? Uh, I asked the question because you didn't yeah. have those, 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 those platforms that you mentioned a couple of years back, this distrust of authority in the United States, as described by Martin McKee, is that something new? It, yeah, the answer is yes, it's new. It is it is a phenomenon. I mean, you know, when Donald Trump speaks in front of a crowd and says that he got the vaccine and he got the booster, they boo him now. So this thing has been released from its con from its container and you know, for people to say, you know, the, the uh, you know, for those of us who understand the facts, and clearly you have people on this broadcast who understand the facts. It's just crazy, you know. You know, the, these are people that have gotten measles, mumps, and rubella vaccines. They, you know, when they travel, there's, you know, there's there's been no upswell of anger about basic medical pr precautions, except that this vaccine has been politicized, and I don't know how you put that back in the bottle. It's a new phenomenon, Guillaume? Yeah, I would say uh, if you yeah. ask some people um, what, what, are, uh, what are the information sources they trust, uh, a majority will, will tell you Facebook. And uh, Facebook can be good in some way, but Facebook is not a media you can trust because although they try uh, to... Uh, put some fake news out, they are, they are not putting enough effort on that, and they should, maybe it's our job, uh, trust more traditional media, I, I would say. And, and, and in, in a way, it's new because uh, the time you spend on the screens on Facebook, and we're going to speak about Spotify later, it's just taking some time out of the time you're going to read the written press and, and see traditional news TV. Uh, Martin McKee, uh, I, I suppose it's difficult when you're a, a, a professor of public health. When you go to a cocktail party, you must get <laughs> you must get uh, pigeonholed each time and ask questions. Do you do you get the well, sense? Well, I haven't that been to a cocktail party for a, quite for a couple of years now because of the pandemic. Good so answer. Good answer. <laughs> but, but can I just come back on your point about how new it is? Because I, I agree with the other speakers that clearly this particular phenomenon is new. But we also do need to remember, you know, the first reference to fake news was in a Canadian journal back about 1920, and uh, you did have 
disinformation being spread throughout history. You know, one of the classic examples were the uh, attacks on Marie Antoinette at the time of the French Revolution by English pamphleteers. Uh, so you've also had issues around individualism versus uh, solidarity. And you've got to remember that the people who left Europe to go to the United States were often the non-conformists, the individualists. Malcolm Gladwell has described them in the Appalachians, the people with my background from Scots Irish, for example. So there was a selection of population anyway. And then, of course, the culture uh, with the opening up of the West and so on did mean that there has always been a difference between uh, the United States in particular and, uh, and Europe. But I totally agree that what we're seeing now is very different. Yeah, and do you get the sense that uh, right now, uh, it's only two years into this and it could go on for longer, as you said at the outset, Martin McKee, but do you have the sense that uh, for now the collective good or individualism is winning out like where you are in London? You know, I think in Europe, you still see the collective good. You still have that sense of solidarity. And of course, we're talking about the United States, but it's not really the United States, because if you look in so many many ways, it's a disunited states. It's there, there's really very little in common between Minnesota and Alabama. And you see that in health statistics. You see it in inequality. You see it in the, um, the, the racial distribution of population in all sorts of things. So I think some of, sometimes in, in Europe, the mistake we make is to look look at the US as a homogeneous block. It's absolutely not. And as I say, somewhere like Minnesota has many characteristics which you can see linking into where many of the population originally came, which is the Scandinavian countries. Stephen Rosenbaum, this is, uh, you said it was noon, listening to Martin McKee. Are you, do you still feel that way? Yeah, no, I mean, I, you know, there is a history of misinformation. You know, I was reading the other day about the great moon hoax of 1830. There's no doubt that, but the difference is that there's been a consolidation of where people get their information. I don't know if you saw the numbers that came out from YouTube the other day, but, you know, the problem is that misinformation is wildly profitable for these companies. I mean, Facebook, it's wildly profitable for Facebook, it's wildly profitable for Twitter, it's wildly profitable for YouTube. And so while they'll make some attempts to put an algorithm against it or put some curators against it, like the, 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 the salacious information, the more salacious, the better, the more people click on it, share it, get outraged by it. And so the idea that people get their quote news, you know, from Tucker Carlson, you know, it's just patently absurd. I mean, he's not a news person. He doesn't even claim to be a news person. This is the Fox and Fox Fox News uh, uh, chat show host. Exactly right. And and you know, I think that you know, not to get off of medicine and into politics, but just as a sidebar, if you look at the number of Americans that genuinely believe that Donald Trump is still president, it's not a small number. It's not an insignificant number. Mm. There's not an inkling of data to back up that claim. There's not a single court case. There's not a single piece of evidence. But if that's all you hear all day is that vaccines are bad and that they're inserting a chip in your arm and that Donald Trump is still president, and if you consume that 24-7, it's I don't know how you cure that because they don't have any other sources. Right, that brings, us, that the brings us to the subject of Spotify. Uh, when I was a kid, you, you had a phonograph or you listened to uh, the rock music station and there was no left-wing rock music station or right-wing rock music station. There was only one when you were uh, in your media market usually. Last week, when rock icon Neil Young told Spotify to choose my music or the podcast of comedian Joe Rogan, the Swedish uh, streaming platform chose Rogan with whom it has a $100 million contract. Spotify taking heat for favoring a commentator accused of spreading COVID misinformation and reacting this week with a new policy of issuing warnings on COVID-related matters uh, before some of its content. Not enough, though, to quell the controversy. Maya yet again has more. He's still rocking in the free world, but not on Spotify. After rock icon Neil Young pulled his catalogue, he was quickly followed by Joni Mitchell and a number of other creators. All fed up with a stream of Covid misinformation on the streaming giant's most popular podcast, The Joe Rogan Experience. 
The controversy has prompted Spotify CEO to announce new measures against fake news. We are working to add a content advisory to any podcast episode that includes a discussion about COVID-19. This advisory will direct listeners to our dedicated COVID-19 hub, a resource that provides easy access to data-driven facts. Spotify launched its quest to dominate the podcast space back in 2019, when it announced it would invest $500 million in the sector. Its strategy also includes securing exclusive contracts with podcasters such as Joe Rogan, paid a reported $100 million to publish four to five episodes per week, listened by 11 million people each time. Rogan has apologized for stirring controversy. So my pledge to you is that I will do my best to try to balance out these more controversial viewpoints with other people's perspectives so we can maybe find a better point of view. Neil Young claims being removed from Spotify will cost him 60% of its streaming income in the name of truth. For the company, though, it's a moment of truth of a different kind as it joins major social networks like Facebook and Twitter in seeing its responsibility grow for the content it distributes. So, Guillaume Calais, is Spotify a publisher or a platform, first of all? To my opinion, today it's a platform, but I think it should be a publisher. Uh, when Stephen mentioned uh, YouTube or Twitter, um, uh, these companies, they are free and they just want your time. And we should listen to some uh, Silicon Valley people who just created the time well spent movement. And they want us not to go more and more time on the... They want us to limit the amount of time we spend on these platforms. Exactly. Or you, you would pay for service, not for free, because you think it's for free now, but they, they, keep, they take your attention, they take your data, and, and, and for that, uh, they, they will make you spend m many, many hours just reading false information. So we have to reverse this. We have to... to and how do you reverse it? In, in this case, was Neil Young wrong? And I asked the question because he's now obliging Spotify to decide what gets published and what's not. And I've read the argument, I'm not making it, but I've read the argument, that... Uh, this means that it obliges Spotify to act as a censor or to act as or to have to decide what is truth and what is false. Um, I, I would say that uh, I think Neil Long is not for censorship when you look at his history, his culture, but uh, Spotify has some responsibility. I just looked at the figures. Spotify has no 31% of market share. Of course, it's got some competitors like Amazon Music, Apple Music, Tencent Music. But no, it is a leader. As Reid Hoffman is saying in his book, Blitzscaling, when you're the leader, you take lots of money in the uh, attention economy, but you have some responsibility. So I think Spotify should now act as a publisher to answer your question. How do you act like a publisher? What do they have to do? You, you have to, to, to have some people that you pay that will moderate some content. When you not agree with it, um, you just con consult the content and, and then people choose you because you're, you're a publisher. Steven Rosenbaum, we saw the blowback uh, even from the likes of the German government when Donald Trump was kicked off of Twitter. Uh, it's, uh, it's, it, it, how do you go about regulating free speech on uh, social media and on big platforms like Spotify? Yeah, I, I would I would scratch my head a little bit about free speech. So, you know, I've written three books and I've got a fourth book that I'm working on and I've showed it to publishers and so far they don't want to publish it. And I could make a big stink and say that they're limiting my free speech, but that would be silly because they're just not publishing my book yet. Hold on, I'm thinking I'll get a publisher. Uh, my point is, part of why I think this is really good good news is, you know, the people that are fans of Joe Rogan, and I was speaking to some young people last night about this, and they said, you know, he used to be really more interesting. He used to kind of debate things and bring on different points of view, but there was never a sense that he had picked left or right or Democrat or Republican or independent. He made a decision to kind of shift his voice to be much more radical. And that serves some of his listeners, but it also doesn't serve what I think was his core audience. So net net, I think what you're seeing here and why I'm excited about it is you're seeing artists get more power and I think you're gonna see that grow and you're seeing consumers get more power because the reality is my 15 bucks a month, you know, if I cancel Spotify tomorrow, guess what? I can get 
Elvis Costello and the Beatles and, you know, old Rolling Stones, lots of places. So the only people they're going to be left with are the hardcore fans of Joe Rogan. And that's not a business for them. Well, let me ask you this. Both Neil Young and Joe Rogan have YouTube channels. Um, should uh, Neil Young have sent the same ultimatum to YouTube? We should ask him that question. It's an excellent question. What are your thoughts on it? Uh, I, ha I think I think he's picked his battles. I, you know, again, realistically, I, I could be wrong, but my guess is there's not a lot of money. You know, if you're Neil Young, you're not losing rent money over this. I think the real question is what's happening to younger artists and younger audiences who make significant part of their career and grow their audience and sell tickets and sell swag, you know, based on their relationship to Spotify. Those those artists so far have not pulled out. And that will be, I think, the next big question. Guillaume Gradet? No, I think just uh, getting back on solutions, we should listen to some people like Tristan Harris, Azaraskin, Guillaume Chalot. They created the uh, Center for Human Technology and they give lots of attention. We are playing here with our brains, our attention. So uh, again, it's lots of uh, responsibility. So again, Spotify should be totally different. Right yeah. now, Europe is is trying to rewrite the rules when it comes to regulating. Yeah, um, that will take time. The internet. Uh, it, it, how do they, again, is this, is this is this something that should be done at the level of France, Europe? Is it up to the United States? After all, most of these companies, not Spotify, but most of them are US based. So what do you do? I think regulation is interesting uh, on the European scale, but regulation cannot do everything. We have to trust business creators uh, that's going to value uh, the real information. We have to be ready to pay for it. Uh, it's uh, like you, you can't buy clothes for one dollar. You have to pay clothes. Uh, a, a big amount of money to respect the value of the clothes. It's but exactly then the are you, same But then are you breaking through? You heard Stephen uh, very eloquently describe the echo chambers that exist in the United States. How do you break through those echo chambers with what you're describing? I, I think um, we have information as a value. We have to pay for it. You have to respect uh, the information, uh, the value of this information. And, and for now, because everyone wants to be a media without having the responsibility of the media. So you just go into the, the bubble, some bubble of false information. All right. The, the, the European Union wonder is, is grappling with the question of how to regulate this. Over in the United States, it seems to be a very different conversation. Reporters questioned the White House Tuesday about Spotify's new label warnings. What they got was a very carefully worded answer. Our hope is that all major tech platforms and all major news sources, for that matter, be responsible and be vigilant to ensure the American people have access to accurate information on something as significant as COVID-19. That certainly includes Spotify. So this disclaimer, it's a positive step, but we want every platform to continue doing more to call out and mis and disinformation while also uplifting accurate information. Stephen Rosenbaum, that's her hope. That's the hope of the White House spokesperson. In other words, uh, Washington is helpless? So, you know, there is a debate going on in Washington about Section 230, um, which we won't get into in this conversation except to say, um, generally speaking, the Internet has grown so quickly that government's just not been able to kind of get ahead of it. And I think that's been mostly a good thing. Um, I, I think the larger question, and, and this is something that only Daniel Eck knows, but we'd love to be able to peer over his shoulder at a spreadsheet and see what the cancellation numbers are like, because for him, in some ways, it's a math problem, right? I mean, his, his statement on Sunday was just lame. It was a non-answer answer. Well, we're going to put up a warning saying, you know, the, the, this content could be bad for you, and then we're going to play it. Earlier, um, I think, yeah, I, I, I think... I think if people cancel, he'll have to make a business decision. Martin McKee, earlier in this conversation, you said how, uh, you know, the, the, the numbers in, in, the, uh, in, the, in the United States, uh, th these were avoidable deaths. Uh, and what we're arguing about is a podcast that invites guests that peddle COVID misinformation. What was your reaction listening to the White House spokesperson saying she hopes that uh, tech giants uh, will behave responsibly? 
Okay, well, looked at from a European perspective, we've got to remember that you have the First Amendment, a constitutional amendment that protects freedom of speech. Now, here we're getting into a debate about whether that amendment is leading to unnecessary deaths. But, of course, you also have a Second Amendment on the right to bear arms, and there is no doubt whatsoever in the mind of most Europeans that that also leads to unnecessary deaths. So, looked that way, then you have to say, looking at the United States from a European perspective, the Founding Fathers and those who came out after them have put in place certain constitutional protections that we would not particularly want in Europe. But that's the problem that they've got. And I think that legislatures... It's leg not just their problem, but, Martin. I mean, we're, we're in Europe. We're watching well, the same shows on YouTube and listening to the same podcasts on Spotify. Exactly. But you can actually... I mean, there, as we know in China and other countries, it is possible to have geo-blocking of content. Uh, that's perfectly feasible. Now, the situation legally at the minute in the European Union under a 2000 directive is that, uh, again, we regard these as platforms and they're not responsible for third-party content. But in Europe, that could be changed. And as we saw with the, the Data Protection Directive and uh, regulation and other things, you know, European legislation can have an extra, and in effect, have an extraterritorial reach. You know, Martin McKee, since the beginning of this uh, pandemic, uh, for those of us who didn't get very good grades in science back in school, uh, we've discovered uh, a lot about <laughs> about uh, about science and just how political it is. Uh, it, it, it's interesting to see how, uh, no matter what continent you're sitting on, there are different opinions on, on these things. Does it go as far when it comes to COVID misinformation as what you just said, that is uh, blocking content from other continents? I'm not saying that you would want to do that, but you know there is the possibility of thinking about things like that. It would be very nice. Uh, but you've got to reality. You've got to recognise the reality that there are things that many of us would feel from if we were living in the United States, we would like to see done, but you cannot do them because of the the constitution. And you know that's simply the reality that we have to live with. But it doesn't mean that we have to go along with the same things. Guillaume Gallet? No, just very uh, briefly. Uh, everyone in the tech uh, industry is now speaking about the metaverse. You know, it's a new world. You know, Facebook uh, just uh, is preparing it, investing a lot of money, building the, the, the biggest supercalculator in the world to, to have this metaverse. When we're going to live in this metaverse, it's going to take a few months, maybe a few years. Uh, it's an immersive uh, machine to maybe that can have some damages on your brain. So I think it's very important for this company, uh, except the regulation, that they have positive behaviors. We, we saw that on, on YouTube. You know, but when you can't ask people to self-regulate forever, right? At some point, you, you, it doesn't work, self-regulation. Yeah, but for, for example, you know, on YouTube, they made some efforts. They put some Wikipedia links uh, on some uh, controversial videos just for, for the readers, for, for the viewers, to, to make their personal uh, decision, opinion, uh, with more information. That, that kind of an interesting step. And when you hear Martin McKee saying, uh, listen, um, the U.S. Can, you know, has its constitution, does that mean it's up to Europe? to regulate this and to define the rules I, I, of the internet of today and tomorrow, because you're talking about meta? Yeah, but I think Europe can have its world. We, we saw that on GDPR. That was an interesting step in, in California following Europe on, on this point. But regulation cannot uh, make everything. And we have to have creators, uh, entrepreneurs leading the way and being in advance. Uh, otherwise, we're just going to step behind. And Steven, Steven Rosenbaum, you agree? It's a big it's a big thought. I, I would say a couple of things. First of all, freedom of speech is not the same thing as freedom of amplification. So I can go stand out in the corner in New York and stand on a soapbox and preach whatever I want to preach. But I don't have any right to expect the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times or Facebook or Spotify to amplify that to their audience. So I think and I think Tristan Harris makes that point really well. Um, secondly, when we talk about labeling, let's let's look at cigarettes for a moment. So there was cigarette boxes, got a big scary label in the US. That did not get people to stop smoking. It ended up being a change in the way the media presented cigarette smoking, it, public service announcements, the labeling of cigarettes, the increase of taxes. I mean, the problems that we're facing around misinformation in these platforms 
is not going to be solved with a single bullet or a, or a piece of federal legislation. It's going to be a change in public consciousness, which is, you know, at some point people decided they didn't want to smoke cigarettes because they didn't want to die of cancer. And that did not happen overnight. And I don't think we're going to make changes in social media overnight. But I do think the Spotify story is, you know, you could circle this date on the calendar because it may be the date that some significant changes started to take place. Some and, and one... One, one last thing. It's about my money. So, for example, it makes me insane that when I pay my cable bill, my cable co company takes a chunk of my money and gives it to Fox News. Makes me insane. I think people that want Fox News should pay for Fox News. I would like to not be one of those people. All right. The, 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 before we go, I want to ask, uh, uh, get back to what we were saying at the outset, which is one of the thing that's been difficult on the human psyche over the last two years, and it was something Martin McKee touched on, is how unpredictable this pandemic has been. How we report matters. We see these images of masksless people in yeah. Denmark. Again, Denmark, the first country in Europe to lift all domestic uh, COVID restrictions on Tuesday. Uh, the talk of uh, the end of mandatory work from home guidelines in France. It doesn't mean that COVID's over, at least not according to the World Health Organization. We're concerned that a narrative has taken hold in some countries that because of vaccines and because of Omicron's high transmissibility and lower severity, preventing transmission is no longer possible and no longer necessary. Nothing could be further from the truth. More transmission means more deaths. More transmission means more deaths. Uh, Martin McKee, is he overstating the case or does he have it right? I think he has it right. So first of all, even if you, so if you reduce the death rate for every case by half, but you have got five times the number of cases, then you're going to have two and a half times more deaths in absolute terms. So that's simple mathematics. But the other thing we have to remember is that the more that this virus circulates, the more likely it is to mutate. Uh, and so for a number of reasons, you know, we really need to drive down the transmission somehow or other. And we are dealing with an incredibly transmissible virus and crucially a virus that transmits before people get ill, which is very different from most other ones, which makes it so difficult to control. And uh, last week when uh, the UK prime minister announced the easing of lockdown measures, what was your reaction? Uh, sorry. Well, I mean, why? Uh, how do you comment meaningfully on our prime minister at the minute when everything he says is basically to get him out of the trouble that he's in? I, I think for a scientist to give any credibility whatsoever to our prime minister is pointless. Is he uh, doing something popular? He's not a scientist. He's a politician. No, he's is it popular, uh, his move to uh, ease uh, those restrictions? He's struggling to save his political career. But the, the problem he has is that there are certainly people who want to see an ending to the restrictions, but there are a lot of people, perhaps 25, 30% of the population who are clinically vulnerable, who are very worried indeed about what is happening. Now he's creating division in society, but this isn't the first time he's created division in society. Uh, no, we remember the beginning of the, of the, of, of the uh, pandemic when, uh, when he, he said it could run through the population. That was, of course, uh, afterwards reversed. Final word on, on this, Guillaume Gallet. How have you, how, how's it been for you? You know, this, well, we're going to do the show live or you're going to have to do it remotely. And it's, it's been a difficult two years, right? Yeah, it's been difficult. And, and also, um, as uh, um, uh, we've been said, uh, we are no, no, no more going to uh, parties. We are not traveling. So it's a bit of a difficulty, but at the same time, um, we experience new stuff like video conferencing. It's, it's quite a, a interesting, but uh, um, I, I prefer seeing people in, uh, in real life. It's much better, even than the metaverse, I would say. All right. Well, we'd prefer to see uh, Martin McKee and Stephen <laughs> Rosenbaum with us here in the studio someday soon, we hope. I want to thank uh, both of you for joining us from London and New York City. I want to thank uh, Guillaume Gallet. Thank you for being with us here in the France 24 debate.